time our dream was to buy a small apartment, have a small car like we have Maruti, you know, and come back and back to the normal life. And but you can have your house or something, those earning from the Saudi Arabia. And so we start there. But once you are in there or once you start earning higher, you have always goal to go better than not coming back. <laughs> right? Because you say now it's very safe. I was working for a company. Their um, most business are in uh, plastics manufacturing. Mm. So the company who has um, all different kind of plastic technology and uh, mainly the machine from Germany. So they have a technology like making a foam sheet, uh, multi-layer film plant. They have a spiral wounded pipe, which is uh, to those uh, like a first kind of machine or technology in India for, for that time. And those Indian companies, they uh, Parath Pipes and, and become a PVD plastics um, and Fiber Web India name. Um, so uh, the one first who brought the non-woven uh, manufacturing line in India in 1994. So they ordered the 1994, which is a supplier by Recofil. So Recofil, it is also company, uh, parent company called Refernizer. They have a manufacturing on plastic industry. They are manufacturer of a film plant, seed plants and hmm. everything. So the owner of uh, Bharat Pipes or PVD had already contact uh, with the Refernizer. They have various machines from the Re Refernizer and then uh, when they, they developed the technology producing the non one fabric that uh, we got the first technology in India, uh, at Ecofield non one mm -hmm. line, you know, yeah. and um, was very good the business that time because there is no, there are only few no manufacturers of this kind of, there is no competition. Mm -hmm. uh, also in the worldwide, there were very few lines, maybe five, six, seven lines. Uh, so they had a very good market, something like that. And uh, that's how I made the, the you know, KT yeah. time. Yeah, the KT, you know, no one, you know, the, yeah. when everybody. And so from there, uh, you know, when you work uh, uh, in India, always we came from the middle class family. So we have always struggling for the financial, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was a trend that if you go in Middle East, like, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, they pay really substantial uh, good salary mm -hmm. and uh, the Indian government allow that the tax-free money so you can really make a lot of money. So we saw that uh, new technology, the, the company that we were working, I was working as a joint venture with the German company, it's called Corovin and then become its PBA and now it's a fiber web non woven mm -hmm. so, so Corovin decided to put the technology or the transfer technology or put the plan with the joint venture in Saudi Arabia. So uh, we saw in advertisement that they are putting the plant over there. And of course, there is a new technology. They don't have a, enough experience, um, engineers or technical staff available. So they approach us. And uh, of course, uh, because we know the technology and it is the same German company, we said, okay, this is the good opportunity. And I joined um, Saudi Arabia, its company called SG and Saudi German non one in 1997. And this is the, my second non one line. This time also it's a new technology in Middle East. There are only first line, so very good market. And so I worked in the two years, very good company. That is so where did you work? This job. Uh, in uh, 1997, I went to Saudi Arabia. Okay. So it was good, uh, good saving in a financial wise uh, compared to the India. In that time, if I compare, um, you get it like 10 times or 12 times more salary, which yeah. is converted in Indian rupees, in which is directly saving. So uh, always people who are the, like middle class, they think, okay, let's go to the work in one or two years in Saudi Arabia or Middle East make a money like a 20 years of that you are earning mm -hmm. and then those 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 time over dream was to buy a small apartment have a small car like we have maruti you know mm -hmm. and come back and back to the normal life and but you can have your house or something those earning from the saudi arabia and so we start there but once you are in there or once you start earning higher you have always goal to 
go better than not coming back <laughs> right this is because yeah. you say now the, the same amount of you have to work and get it 10 times less it's very difficult to, to set up the mind and so i start also looking further opportunity and the same company that Corovin has a joint venture. Now they were planning to expand their um, non-woven technology-wise from Recofield in the Italy. Mm. So the project manager, uh, Werner Bendixson, he was German in Saudi Arabia. He was going to Italy and he asked me, would you want to join me? Because we work together with the project and he knows me very well. And um, I said, yeah, I, I never been to Italy. I never been to Europe. You know, from India and was coming from the small village like Wapi Daman and going to Europe, we don't know. Um, so I said, okay, I will go there. Um, and in between the, the Werner Bendixson who was operation manager, he gets sick and uh, he is not able to join. But I said, okay, I will go by myself uh, yeah. over there. And um, so 90, end of the 99, I went to Italy first time. Hmm. And when I went to Italy, actually, I don't know what is a pasta means. I don't know the Italian language, nothing, zero. And and in Italy, the people are very nice. But, you know, you have to understand in Europe that especially those countries, they don't speak the, in 90s, right. the English. English is not their language. Mm -hmm. You know, even the plant, yeah. hardly few people speak English, like in a sales department or something like that. That yeah. even accounting people, even my production manager has a, a, a English is not a very good. Mm -hmm. My English was also not good. Today I a little bit better, maybe, but those times we study in English medium, but the pronunciation and the communication we never do in India and Saudi Arabia also a little bit. But it's okay because and so in the plan, people are uh, talking in Italy. So I said, okay, I have to learn Italian, right? And I start learning Italy, talking with the operated operator and then the production supervisor and also the company support me they hire a teacher for me that can come and teach me like a, three times a week i joined also the the italian um, government has a cl free classes for any, any any foreigners who can come and who want to learn so i also joined those classes and uh, and, and learning i watch i have a tv i don't have an english channel i just watching you know and then i start learning that how to cook pasta and pizza because every day we have to go to restaurant eat pasta or pizza. But, <laughs> but uh, I learned pasta and uh, I think you can ask Palak uh, and also our small community when they were kids, I can make the best pasta, you know, uh, really learning good. from Italy. Yeah. That's okay. So, uh, so th those uh, working to Italy, I always been in contact with the manufacturer uh, uh, of Recofil uh, the engineers. So they were in India, they were same team in Saudi Arabia, they are the same teams in Italy. And they know me now very well, they, they know that I understand their technology machine. And uh, Italy was working good, uh, people are very nice, the company now is fiber web, everything good. Uh, but Europe uh, has a difficulty to to working visa or long term resident visa for yeah. any, any foreigner. And as you know, those time US is a quite popular for a working H-1B visa. And so I said, okay, uh, I start to approach uh, Recofil and say, do you have a possibility to work for you um, based on the US? And then today is my boss. There was like, he was like a second boss that time that leave uh, from Recofil. He, check with the management and he come back he said yes they have they have a yeah. agent called Fitech in uh, Richmond Virginia and I have a chance to work uh, with through the agent to the Recofil working together and then Fitech filed for me in H1B visa and I had my H1B visa end of the uh, 2001 after the 9-11 happened and I we move um, with the uh, the Palak, Palak was that time, you know, five years. Uh, I was old. very young. <laughs> yeah. and, and he was going in Italy and uh, learning Italian, but oh, I don't yeah. think he remember. Uh, and, the, <laughs> and the teacher, they don't know what is good morning. When, yeah. you know, we went to drop the Palak, he don't know when you say good morning. He, she cannot reply <laughs> because she yeah. don't know what we are talking. You know, that's how in yeah. Italy was that time. But uh, so we moved to 2001 um, uh, 
to to us and the recofil has a first project uh, was project going on very close to philadelphia the city called hazeltown the company called first quality normal one now it's uh, uh, bought by another company and different name um, so we decided to stay close to philadelphia as well um, you know nipo's um, mother sister or cousin they were living um, his uh, it, nipo had a big family over in philadelphia and uh, they were very supportive and so we decided to stay close by them because i know that when i joined recofield as a service engineer i need to travel and you know she will get the help from the all his cousin and cousin brother and sisters from uh, his family side, her family side yeah. so, so so 2001 i joined a recofield and i start traveling to i i am working as a field service engineer providing those those recofill machine who buy the recofill machine for, uh, to start up the uh-huh. machine uh, set up the production and um, doing all the technical service for the recofill line and so since 2001 i have been traveling for the recofill machine around in 30 countries uh-huh. and almost in all south america you know in asia and everywhere and i got the chance to know the people how their technical skill as well as the culture for each country yeah. and then i can compare uh, with the with the us you know so in between those long journey we got the company filed from our h1b to immigration status and then we become a we get the green card and then um, we have a, we, we get the you no know, green card and after five years we get the citizenship so, for this and during long time I have been to touch with the, so many company yeah. and uh, one day I went to one of our, our my car windshield was broken and I went to the one automatic and he is a he's like an old guy around 65 that time and he asked me what you are doing and I said okay I'm an engineer and he like inspired me he told me he's he like very hard American you know he said okay this country need people like you engineers or technical skill we are missing this skill and he told me everybody is studying for like high professional office job lawyer and marketing but he said we don't have this and this we are going to have crisis and then the future the manufacturing would be have difficult and I, I i i think about this and i said yeah this is very good point and after this we said okay let's america is a very good the country for opportunity that we know for before and yeah. anything is easier here and okay let we want to start something to manufacturing here to you know um to, to support um or also to grow or give the idea or something like this because it's very easy here to business friendly country you know the country mm. is like yeah. very easy to start a business you don't have a difficulty yeah. like back home we have in india something like that now it may be uh, getting better in india but um, that time was difficult so we said okay i want to start manufacture and uh, palak was studying and we said okay what should we start you know what is the product we start because we don't want to also direct competitive that coming from asia or china especially that you cannot you know then compete with them due to the the cost of the operation is very high here so we, we said, okay, what is the big market here? Medical and pharmaceutical is the is a big business, right? So we said, okay, let's start something uh, which is we can support the pharmaceutical or medical, but we have a limited fund and limited knowledge. So we don't want to go higher in manufacturing the, uh, the pharmaceutical product, which required FDA approval or something, but we can start with the packing supplier which yeah. does not require that much uh, fda we have, need to have a gmp facility and something and then we searching and i send email to the one of the machine supplier who make a package insert so it whatever you know the prescription drugs that we buy it has an instruction sheet which is folded in the small size that go on the bottle or side of the package and i said i yeah. write, write the email to this guy and I, I was uh, not kind to, because I used my private Gmail address to see. And I thought maybe he was not going to reply me because, you know, he said this is junk email. But luckily he replied me, even right. my Gmail address and showed me what is the requirement. Then, uh, you know, then we went there and meet and 
we got the, the first machine in uh, 2019 um, to start with the Adia. And that's how we started. And I think Palak can explain a little bit from there. He was involved more, so he knows better than uh, better than <laughs> me after that. <laughs> so, so my background was, you know, I was previously studying uh, neuroscience at Temple. And, um, you know, it was going, I was three years into uh, my degree. And then that's when we started the, uh, you know, decided to start the company because, you know, it wasn't uh, really decided that we wanted to be in school for so long. And, you know, we decided that, hey, you know, this is a great idea. So uh, for package inserts, what they are, let me give you a little bit of background. So any sort of prescription medication, right, requires, um, uh, like the packaging products require uh, inserts. So what inserts are, you see this, you know, small folded piece of paper. It takes this big sheet that is, has all of the prescription information, um, side effects of the drug and everything. And we basically fold it together onto the machine Yeah, components that yeah. folding together into the package insert. So this is what our machine does, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, when we first started, we had no idea. You know, we had a little bit of idea of machinery. My dad's background in engineering. Um, I had no previous knowledge on the machines. You know, I have no engineering background. However, um, you know, my dad said, you know, we can start uh step by step. You know. So the first step we were, we decided was how do we get the market, you know? So what the market was, uh, we have to target a lot of the pharma manufacturers. So my first day I was, you know, making a lot of cold calls um, to a lot of manufacturers. We were reaching out, hey, you know, we're supplying inserts, outserts, and little by little, we ended up, you know, meeting with a few um, potential customers. We started sending them samples. We'd go meet with them in person, and um, we, that's how we marketed and you know built a you know customer base in the like northeast where we would you know uh, supply them at a quicker turnaround time. So one of the biggest um, I would say like challenges in the manufacturing industry is how quick the service is, uh, quality, right, and um, your turnaround time. You know if you can provide uh, your product at a faster uh, speed than your competitors and also the price so that's right. you know those are the biggest factors we um started yeah. targeting yeah that, that's so. an amazing story i mean like that's the american dream that's what most people come and like <laughs> your goal is you come here and you end up starting your own business and you you got the most you could get out of it so it's a, it's a sure. amazing story uh I, I think the the part we were talking about last time where you're telling me how initially just to get those cold like those initial leads you were just calling every single person that was every single day yeah so i mean uh, i can talk a little bit more about it was when you know we used a um a crm called hubspot and what was that that we kind of just um gathered all of our data and you know we don't have uh we don't have um we're still in the process of improving our marketing strategies by implementing the right people. But initially, you know, it's just our own research. How do we do this? How do we get customers? So we started with HubSpot. We would, you know, uh, kind of target uh, or look, you know, on Google or anywhere we could find where these guys are using inserts. So find out the people who are using the inserts. We would reach out to them. And the other thing uh, we noticed was um, a lot of the, a lot of the, the biggest challenge in the supply chain is that, uh, most of the manufacturers or customers, they don't want to change their vendors. Mm. Uh, you know, that uh, it's very hard to convince someone to change their vendor, even if you're, uh, you know, offering a marginally lower price or something like that. Um, they they kind of, it, it's almost like a flow a routine for them, you know, every month, okay, we're going to have this and this. But once you, you know, that's how, um, what we are, what we're doing in our uh our approach is that um, the customers that we have kind of uh, accumulated so far, they're like some small business customers, some large manufacturers, and now it's through word of mouth and referrals, references, you know, we say, um, because we're providing better service and better quality than a lot of the competitors, maybe they're bigger companies, however, for, you know, awkward jobs and stuff, we'll take on the jobs and we'll provide the better service. So from that word of mouth, you know, it's getting getting out there that you know we're also doing it so yeah. it's a step-by-step -step process you kind of just learn you know take what you, you you learn every day and then use that uh to move forward so yeah most of the manufacturers we've spoken to so far keep talking about how the relationship with the like purchasing is the only thing that's important they do like more important than any sales price 
Uh, even the quality or speed, the relationship once it's built, then they like you just want to stick with one person. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. So, um, Kashik Bhai, we wanted to know you've been in this industry for like more than 30, 40, more than 30 years now. So, like, uh, what are some of the trends that you have noticed, especially in the like in the machine space? So, for example, yeah, no. like the Ricofil line, how how has it evolved? Like over time, or what is the new like upgrades that most people want to get now, or how is that changing compared to how it was back in like two thousand? So you know that's what um I what I what I understand or learn is um while back working in uh, in India when you know I started in working in ninety one, we have operator like. Uh, they don't know maybe writing on English, but they are very good operator. They know exactly how the machine has been set up with the scale, with the manual. And uh, because without the computer, without the background knowledge of any, any you know, chemistry, they know how this machine is. This is what we are now slowly losing those those kind of grip. So in a new uh, new line that we supply them, it's very even we have a computer, we have a training class, we have presentations, how to be teach. But those technical skill we are missing, and um, and this is uh, I think we don't know because of the competitiveness or how uh, the, the the new trend is changing hmm. but this is this is uh, uh, missing and to overcome this i think the artificial intelligence and more automation is going to help to okay. to substitute this so what i learn is we i as and i also told people like that we have to start something that every machine can gather the data and implement it by itself. So only the people who is operating the machine, he can just observe right. and he don't have a less way to operate. That's right. where there is a less possibility to make mistakes. Hmm. Yes, I remember when you and Rajput, you and Alex were talking about this idea of, you know, uh, getting the AI and so that the machine can, or one person is able to see all of these different statistics or details on a screen and be able to, based on the weather or whatever different parameters are, that would be really interesting. And uh, we've been doing some research in that space. It's this thing called digital twins, where you can visualize your machine like from a, like from a different location if it if it's possible. Uh, yeah. Oh, so 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 you mean like a camera system or uh, uh, the digital? Uh... Yeah. So it'll be like a replica of of the machine on on a screen. Not 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 oh. necessarily a camera, but uh, it could be a interesting possibility. Like yeah, it's like, like using a you could use like anything. You could use a combination of cameras, sensors, and even general like machine so, data to to get all the information remotely. Uh, okay. Okay. Because now, for example, our non-worn industry, what is the, the the quality? Before we were like initially ninety four, we don't have a camera to look mm. at the fabric. They were just usually people watch and look at. Now we do have a camera systems, um, high speed camera that can even detect the very small, even if like a small like a sugar grain kind of defect, it can detect from the product. Mm. And now we were trying to implement that using those defect and it will also have a position which can see the what parameter is affecting and it will suggest the operator to change those parameter or it will ask okay this is the parameter required to change and this i will make it this change once the operator confirm it can slowly change those parameter and again monitor the defect whether it is is the defect is gone or still exists yeah yeah exactly yeah that would be pretty interesting and in terms of like with all this automation, do you think it's more possible for American companies to run the plants over here itself rather than outsourcing to India or China because it requires less manual labor? Or do you think that those countries still have a huge benefit because of operation costs? Uh, no, I think the ones we got, uh, we, uh, there are certain manufacturing like non-woven and certain things. It has to be manufactured here in US because 
also with the logistically and a quick turnaround it's it's not difficult as long as the product has a variable uh, uh, size and different it cannot be manufactured or outsourced. You know, some of them like a standard for like a face mask. It right. can be, you know, stock and do. But if there is something specially, special right. size required, it has to be manufactured here. And for those, they have to manufacture here. And, you know, the new generation is not going to, I think, learn more on the on the technical skill wise, they are going to more right. on um, computer wise, some something, and they will be maybe more interested to remove or operate the machine based right. on the computer and data than using the skills. So we, I think all industry is, uh, will be very happy if we can provide them the solution, like a kind of artificial intelligence provide to running their machine, which will give the more productivity, you know, and efficiency yeah. wise. Yeah. Um. So I guess you mentioned like, yeah, like younger people, like not in, in manufacturing. So Palak, for you, what do you think are some ways that like can get more people involved in like in this space and get them interested to work on? Yeah, we've, we've noticed that it's mostly just uh, people graduating and then they want to go into finance or computer science because those industries are what everyone does. But um, if, if I think if robotics and these kind of advanced uh, things are integrated into manufacturing it, it can generate more interest in in this space for like people who are graduating from college what do you think um i can i cannot speak for anyone else's experience i can only speak for my own experience right and i can talk about how my interest in kind of the manufacturing industry kind of um started right because i always also you know uh, when i first started i was not planning to be in the uh, you know engineering field or any sort of manufacturing industry however i think um once i started it, it, it came down to when i first started working on machines itself um kind of you know with the vijuk fa53 we kind of uh, i was the first you know month or six months i was Every single day, I was just on the machine for eight to 10 hours, just figuring out how to set it up. Oh, what does, what functioning, uh, you know, what this function does, what this plate does. Oh, if we, you know, slide this uh, slider over here, it does this. So I think over time, the interest kind of just, uh, you know, being on the machines, it, it felt like, uh, you know, when you're a little kid playing with Legos and you're building little blocks and it, you know, turns into this uh, big thing. I think it just uh, the interest kind of uh, started from that. So I think for the younger generation, it's, uh, you know, we're more attracted to what's in front of us, right? And what's in front of us is a lot of like, you know, everything's on on the computer, whether it's social media, um, communications, even right now we're having a Zoom meeting instead of, you know, face-to-face -face communication. So a lot of, uh, uh, because technolo technology is improving and going faster, right? Um, I think that's what's uh, attracting the new generation to a lot of these remote jobs, remote industries, or maybe working with a computer science industry. But I think to transition their interest, um, AI is probably going to be the biggest transition into uh, uh, that allows young people to transition into the manufacturing industry because AI is something that's, you know, new, attractive, um, you know, we've, uh, it's almost like a, you know, when we were kids, from my experiences, you know, think of AI, it's almost like a science, uh, science fiction kind of yeah. um, uh, technology, right? But now we, we're seeing it being implemented more. We're seeing new, um, you know, uh, you know, robotics, you look at the Amazon, you know, Amazon warehouses, they're using robotics for everything, you know, from now they're packing. So I think uh, understanding that AI technology is becoming a bigger factor into it, um, as well as uh, uh, what was VR, you know, using a VR to see how machines are built and, um, you know, uh, see different parts you know, mm -hmm. be coming together. I think that is, um, that is one of the ways that the younger generation definitely can be more uh, it's more appealing to the younger generation now. So I think that's what I can say from my experience. Yeah. I know there's, um, it, it might require them to maybe just, you know, get their hands dirty. I think a lot of, uh, it takes, you know, your own effort to, oh, okay, you know, I want to, you know, learn how this works. Maybe start with your bike or your car or something. Hey, how does this engine work? You know, like, okay, let me just figure this out. Um, so little things like that, it, it'll start to if you if you actually take the effort to go into it, I think that's you know yeah. Yeah, interesting. I think yeah, that's very true. A lot of people are into like three D printing and additive right. stuff because like everyone can get that in their own house. And you know once once you once you see it, then it's easy to understand. But um, yeah. these things since they, they were always in like Asia or some other country, no no one really knows how how these machines built. Right. What's going on? Exactly. Exactly. I think 
Um, uh, but with definitely with uh, additive manufacturing, because um, that's also one to one of the industries that we're at actually planning to kind of uh, get into. And we're still in the, the development kind of like research and uh, understanding phase of it. Um, but we realized that through like, you know, even myself, uh, the past three years, I've been working on machines here at Adia. Um, there's a lot of things that we can realize, oh, you know, instead of a human uh, operator here, we can maybe if we had an automated, maybe, you know, convey system here or mm -hmm. having a, you know, maybe like, for example, um, on our Mark Andy machine, we have, you know, the Mark Andy, it prints then uh, makes these labels for us. And then, you know, we have to have it uh, take the roll off and then put it onto an, uh, a, a slitter, right? That's another separate machine. So we're thinking, hey, you know, what would be an easier way? Well, if we had a convey system that would take the roll directly to the slitter, that's another way where we can auto, you know, remove the human factor of it and then make it more automated. So these are just little um, aspects where we think that, okay, what is the the future? And with additive manufacturing, I think it is uh, a big, it's going to play a big role into making automation um, yeah. become more prevalent in manufacturing, right? Like let's say you have uh, a machine that needs to be, or a specific part for a machine that needs to be designed. Um, usually now you might go to two different suppliers for two different parts and then assemble them together. Well, with additive manufacturing, we can, you know, uh, design the part ourselves mm -hmm. and then print that exactly with any sort of material, you know, different alloys, uh, different metals, whatever we need to. It, it makes it just more efficient. Yeah, so. definitely. And there's all these tools now. There's this website. I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, there's these websites where you can just specifically order a part for a prototype and you get a quote instantly in like a day or two. And then you get the part, like it can be a complex design and they ship it to your house and like, so these are like marketplaces where you can they they just outsource it so they give it to another shop and they uh, they do the job of like getting the the leads and then giving it out. So um that's not introduced in India yet, but in the like it it's there in its early stages in India, but out here in the US that's growing pretty fast. It's very it's growing extremely fast, and so I mean our our plan is to also implement it. Um, you know. Uh, overseas eventually because we see that india a lot of um you know one of the biggest uh uh struggles i would say in india is that having a like very streamlined process for manufacturing in the factories right so a lot of you know it's a lot of bureaucracy too in india where it takes you know slower time but i think if we, you know little by little we can improve the automation and it'll make it more fast and more efficient in india as well for the entire manufacturing issue there definitely definitely um, Kaushik Bhai, you're an expert on like uh, on these machines that are used mainly for non-wovens or do those like skills also transfer over to like other types of machines or yeah, how does that work? So you might be on my knowledge wise, you, you know, it's uh, I think once you are in a technical field, um, I uh, realize that you can understand any machine very quickly. So working with the normal one and another company i gained the knowledge and um, uh, when we bought this machine for a uh, folding machine and then the, the printing machine which is mostly in like a digital printing but once you have knowledge like sometimes people like say oh he, he can program everything but when he has a problem with the machine and i can tell them okay this may be problem because you have a you develop that such a skill that any machine, when you see, and if there's a problem, you can look at and oh, this kind of problem could be from here. You know, this is this. Um, so it the it any 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 new generation which is going to work on a technical field, they will definitely gain those skills. So if they were doesn't matter if they were working in non one industry tomorrow, they can start producing or making the uh, pharmaceutical company which is bottle or making auto injector. They will learn and understand the machine very quick yeah definitely it's like even in computer programming it's like once you learn one skill it might not be directly the same but the core fundamentals are the same so you can learn the next thing quite easily that's correct because that's for your interest right so for for me it's difficult you know to learning programming but for me to know to understand the machine is very easy you know anything it can be making right yeah same over here it's like much harder for me to understand like the physical side of things so yeah that's right yeah 
I think that's with anything, um, though. I think over time, when you spend a lot of, uh, you know, hours constantly learning uh, about one thing, like even me, I had no prior um, history of uh, any sort of, you know, working on any machine. But the past three years, I think over time, I've learned a lot about the folding machines. And I can say from what I've learned, uh, you know, even, we, we, you know, 20, 2020, uh, we had the pandemic and we even started manufacturing face masks uh, through out of idea for about a year and a half. Um, because we saw the opportunity uh, to, with the you know rapid, uh, it was a, it was a, the market was, for the face mask was very uh, prominent at the time for you know what was going on, and so we also had a access to non-woven fabrics, the material and quality uh, non-woven fabric material, including the mount blown for it. Um, so you know we we I went to India uh, during the I think it was the March of 2020 for one month to get the parts ready and manufacture the parts for the face mask machine. So we had the parts manufactured there. Um, and then I flew back and then we also, <laughs> it was a funny story because we had a delay uh, because of the transport, you know, the transportation was cut off from China. So we had a, uh, in India, so we had a delay of getting the machine back to here. So we had to, you know, go get a different machine from a different manufacturer we had that year. But, uh, you know, going back to what I was saying is that working from the folding machine, we were able to figure out what we needed to on the mask machine as well. And on those mask machines, you know, at the time we were contacting so many manufacturers. So we got it from Chinese manufacturers. However, you know, even uh, they didn't have any manuals. You know, there was no, either there was no manuals or the manuals in Chinese, we didn't access to it. So it was a lot of trial and error, you know, figuring out what it does. But you're able to figure out the machine because you know, some of the functions, uh, the core uh, functionality of a lot of the machine is very, very similar. So, yeah. so how do you guys divide? Like, Palak, mostly you focus on like getting new leads and sales, and or do you guys both work on the machine and sales, or how? It's how kind of both. Uh, yeah, you know, just just all around, pretty much. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Some days, some days we're making calls. Some days we have a meeting with new potential customers. Some days I'm on the machine all day, you know, twenty four hours because we have a problem. Uh, some days I'm working on designing labels on Illustrator because, you know, a customer needs that. So it's kind of like all around uh, uh, work, but you get to, uh, I like that better because I like that better than having one routine thing doing every single day. So I think it's, that's uh, it. So, so you, you were asking before what, what, you know, what I see here, the missing is, and what, what I have learned is like, you know, I, I get the engineering school because I study on from eighth standard, we have a called technical school. So which is, which we learn how to make a small job out cutting the metal, using the lathe machine, using the rondo. And that time we were not happy because the teacher was very strict, you know, in India there, you know, it is. But as soon as we hold the hexo, he was not looking how I make the job. If I use the, my hexo holding wrong, he will, you know, just slap <laughs> that time is allowed. Uh, and and so that was good for when I'm in engineering because I know exactly. So, so I think in US, um, I was very, very happy when, you know, when we go, when the Palak and go to school, I look at the school, nice music classes, or they have an instrument that I don't think maybe Bollywood has into the school. And I was surprised, it was so nice school. But now when I see the skill, you know, um, working force is missing, I think our, our school system should also start to developing those kind of uh, technical skill. That is, you know, teach or get interest of the of the new student, you know, who has opportunity to to develop. And once they see, they maybe start to learning more. And I don't know, maybe there are some school may have, but most of the schools here is missing uh, technical education compared to the, especially in Germany. Germany, when you go, the small children, he can immediately know when you ask them to bring the screwdriver, he can go to the basement and bring the right tools. And this is, I think, we have missing in US and if, if the school system or government involved and, uh, you know, upgrade those kind of a system would be, would be very, very easily because at the end of the day, even, you know, you will have a, so many robots running all the equipment, but you need somebody to fix those robots, right? Or somebody has to, to fix this robot because this at the end it's mechanical parts or, you know, mechanical and electrical parts and somebody need to understand those robots. Uh, so, so always there should be a requirement for the the skill skill people 
And I think if they start teaching them right now, maybe the next uh, generation would have a more skill, um, you know, uh, people available. And then maybe they with the skill knowledge, they can develop and make something more for the humanity and universe. <clears throat> That's so true. We had, so at university, there is a shop where a machine shop where they, they teach the same skills like the lathe and all of those. And we spoke to the person who runs that from 30 or 40 years. And he said now, because of all of the automation and all of the uh, CNC and stuff, there's very little knowledge or interest in learning the, the fundamental things because all of it can be automated. But definitely, like you said, like having that knowledge today will be very valuable because even though like nobody talks about that, but if you're the only person who knows this out of like thousands of people, mm -hmm. that can be very valuable. Yeah, that's that's good for the for the for the country and everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, I think um that was all the questions. But uh it was amazing talking to both of you and learning about your journey in manufacturing and also how you started and grew Adya Pharma. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it was this is really inspiring also to know like to start from a small village in India and now you have your own plant. So uh, like a lot of Americans who are born here are not able to achieve that. So uh, I think it's uh, because, you know, maybe uh, people, sometimes they create the interest and sometimes they need to build some kind of competitiveness and, you know, willing. Yeah. Uh, and once, so I think once you are in safe zone, maybe you don't want to change and always have the different people have different interests, right? Yeah, I think that's all for today. And like, uh, we'd love to keep in.